Durand. I'm a professor in the uh, College of Pharmacy with the Pharmacy Practice Department and also the department chair. Thank you. Hi, this is Laura Sword, and I'm out of the uh, Department of Nursing, and I'm adjunct. So I have a day job down in Ohio. Welcome. I'll go next. Um, my name is Kaki Wolfer. I'm a faculty in the hospitality program, um, which is in the College of Business. I too have another day job. I actually own some Subway restaurants. So okay. uh, this has been a really uh, interesting. I can't hear you. I don't know. That might be mine. I hear you, Catherine. Oh, okay. I, I have run into trouble with this computer before. So um, yeah, I just, I teach in the College of Business and the hospitality program. Thank you. Well, I'm Kelly Sinkowski and I'm one of the course designers in e-learning. And um, this is my day job. And I also teach grad classes for DVSU. And um, I work for the Ottawa ISD is part-time too. Did we have another person coming? Go ahead, Tracy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Tracy Russo. And as Kelly said, this is also my day job. I'm the senior online designer here. And then I teach adjunct at Baker University, not Baker College that's here, but that's actually out of Kansas in instructional design. And pretty much I just, have been working with faculty in course development for a decade, following about a, two decades in K-12 professional development and teacher ed. So I'm addicted and I love it. And mm -hmm. I don't know, Young, I don't know, how, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but if you'd like to go ahead and just give a brief introduction. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, okay, let me turn off my... Oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, so, um, so my first name is Young. Okay, my last name is Xu Xu. I'm a associate professor in marketing department. Uh, my area is uh, business data and analytics, and uh, uh, we are promoting the, uh, you know, like uh, business support, business intelligence, uh, data understanding, data scientist, and uh, I'm interested to uh, learn some some uh, insight from you guys. Wonderful. And we just had uh, Anne join us. Anne, if you want to quick introduce yourself. <clears throat> Trying to get my video and everything going. I'm Anne Norcross. Okay. I'm a art history faculty at Kendall College of Art and Design. I just got out of class, so I'm running a few minutes late. <laughs> Perfect, we're doing intro, so you came at the exact right time for your turn. Great. <laughs> um, so we're gonna get started because we don't wanna keep you past the hour. <clears throat> and we can uh, let whoever in if you want to kind of keep an eye on that, Tracy, for me while I'm not looking at that part, <laughs> if someone joins us. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Trying to figure out how to advance my screen while I'm sharing. <clears throat> oh, here we go. Okay, so I just wanted to first start um, briefly with design thinking, because that's kind of the, the um, relationship that we are building today and, and how to use that process for our courses for course improvement. So pretty much the design process is uh, an empathize, define, ide ideate, prototype, and test. So how I have linked that into courses is for the empathize is simply kind of things like your course outcome, what are your course challenges, um, thinking through your courses as far as what worked, did, what didn't work, um, whether it's assignments, discussion boards, <clears throat> whatever the case may be. Um, the next one would be define. So really defining your outcomes, looking at how your outcomes are being addressed by your content, but your assessments, especially the assessments. So specifically looking at your assessments and that piece is what we're gonna kind of talk through today. So, um, and part of the define is things like the activities, assessments, discussions, the navigation of your course, all those things that help with the student's use. Um, ideate things like identifying your gaps is kind of what we're talking about today and then generating ideas how to do that. 
prototype as you try it out. And this is kind of where we are in this process if because we're going to be looking at a course that you've taught and how do we improve that with the design process. So when you're talking about your prototype, you've already used your prototype because you've already taught the course um, or designed your course. So when, when we look at that, we've, we've tested it out, we're looking at that. So it's kind of a circle. You design your prototype, you test it, you teach it, and we're coming back to the empathize. So we're really gonna be evaluating your, the course and looking at different aspects of, for, for improvement purposes. <clears throat> um, so what we're talking about today, and um, Tracy's gonna elaborate on this in a couple slides later, but we're really looking at evaluating your course each semester. Now, we're not talking about a redesign of your course. We're just evaluating your course. Um, this is what we're asking each person to evaluate your course using this design process and then make a change. So we're not asking you to revamp the whole thing, but make a change. Find something that you can improve upon. So in order to find something to look for, um, you might know off the top of your head, oh gosh, that assignment just did not work the way I wanted it to work. Um, I didn't get the response I wanted. They had a hard time figuring out what to do. But if that isn't the case and you don't have something in mind that you really wanted to take a look at, um, we can take a look at the course itself for some of the, those examples and some of those indications. So as far as even content flow, so when you were designing your course and teaching your course, you might take a look at your course schedule and say, Mm, you know what, I think I'm going to switch out these two weeks. And even if it's not a content switch, it could be just a flow, course flow switch as far as getting what they need to know before they do their projects or things like that for you. So using Canvas, we're going to look at those indicators that I mentioned in the previous slide. So we want to just say, okay, I don't know if there's an assignment that was difficult or bombed or didn't like or wasn't fun to, to um, grade. Because even for you, if there's an assignment that you dread grading, let's take a look at that. Tracy and I could even help you come up with ideas. How do we help you make it a little more fun for you or for the students? There's all kinds of just little tweaks that will make it even more fun for yourself, but also for the students for their engagement. So when you're in Canvas, if you have not yet looked at the analytics, we're going to use a couple of those to try to get a, an indicator if there's something that didn't work for you assignment wise or assessment wise, I should say. Um, so if you're in your course on your home screen, there is a tab that says new analytics on the far right, which I have circled in this first picture. Then when you get to that, you can see some different printouts of it. So it'll give you your course grade. That's the first one in the, in the second picture with uh, that I've circled the headers. So you can look at your course grade, but the one I'm really looking at is the weekly online activity and some of the reports. So under the weekly online activity, if you click through that, it'll say assignments and discussion boards. So you can really fine tune what were the different grades that the students had on the different discussion boards. Because if you see a big dip or, or in an assignment, if there's a big dip in the um, scoring, you might want to take a look at that. Is it instructions? Is it <clears throat> content? Is it, uh, there's so many variables in an assessment. Is it maybe we can come up with ideas for that assessment? Um, so it's really fine tuning what you're looking at. Now in the second picture, <clears throat> you see the graphs of everything. That is looking at the activity for your students, um, clicking into your course. Now, if I were to scroll down on that page in the bottom of that graph, they even will, it'll tell you, Canvas will tell you exactly each page, how many times it was viewed. <clears throat> so maybe if you look at something and there's content to do, like instructions or content to do your assessment piece or the project or the paper, if that's viewed a lot more times than other things, then maybe they're having trouble with the instructions. Or So it's really fine tuning, digging down what is it that they're they're returning to that page for? <clears throat> um, and did they need that to accomplish something else? So it can really kind of tell you how did that flow go? Now, if your grades are um, pretty pretty accurate uh, as far as um, a not big dip. So if you don't have a 20 point dip in your grades, then they might be fine. <clears throat> but maybe there's an, there's an assessment that just isn't very fun to grade for you, or you've done it for 
four semesters and you'd really like to, you know, assess the same content, but hopefully in a different way that's more fun for you to grade or more engaging for the students. That's something else we can look at. So this is really how you to use the, the design thinking is to evaluate it, look at what worked. And again, sometimes you know right off hand what didn't work or maybe something was really great that you really like and you want to emulate that in another assignment, some of the things that did work. So um, it's really evaluating. Now, I, I can't tell you what worked or what didn't on your course. I could look at a dip, but perhaps that dip in score is it's a really hard content and there's a lot of terminology that they had to memorize, you know, pharmacy or something like that. Well, that's an explainable dip. So I'm not talking about those types of things. So I'm really talking about something that they might have struggled with or that you don't enjoy or the students seem to not enjoy, um, something that we can do for improvement. And again, just, just kind of looking at one thing each semester, you know, maybe not the whole course over uh, overflow. So um, with that, I'm going to leave that to Tracy to really talk through how, the how part and, and more details. Let me unshare, Tracy. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. I'm going to build on a lot of what Kelly said. It's really helpful, as Kelly showed, to use those demographics to hone in on all the different types of you know, activities and things that may or may not need improvement. I'm toggling back to share my screen. There we go. I need, OK. So let me move the Zoom bar. OK. And I think. You know, when we started these PD sessions, it is with that intention of next semester being different. You know, it's kind of fun. I don't know how many of you are in different Facebook groups, but if you scroll backwards and go from, you know, the present all the way back up to, um, I'm going to move it into presenter view, into March when we started, it's really interesting also even there watching the different energy levels of people as they um, evolved over time. Oops. That was the wrong button. I didn't want the share button. I wanted the present button. There we go. But yeah, so I think that, you know, that last picture over the last month and a half, a lot of people have kind of expressed variations of that. I know Anne, um, Rhonda, you know, as she said yesterday in a meeting, being the art history, she had some beautiful artwork of some ladies that were, you know, I'm sure it's a famous painting, but not being the art historian where bottom line, the collapsed lady in waiting type of thing. But here we are, we survived. And you know, Laura shared she's having, you know, some of hers is going very well because she's taught online in the past. There's again the whole spectrum. But if we're all kind of exhausted, as Kelly said, let's just start with picking one. And then the question becomes, how do we choose that one? And I think it's really critical at this point in time to focus on the positives wherever we can. There's of course been a lot of talk on you know, plagiarism and also even just the general negativity because the reality is this is a rough time across the board, whether it's you know, our circumstances, our children's circumstances, our families, our parents, our friends, our, and, and you know, that's going on behind our scenes, then every one of our students and you multiply it by the number of students, the number of just change management is incredible. So we wanna be very strategic you know, these are kind of the five strategies. I'll go in a little bit of detail in some course examples on what this looks like in practice. When we take that design thinking and we say, okay, we're going to solve these problems or solve these challenges and make something high quality of it to improve next semester. So Kelly mentioned a little bit about this as far as, um, you know, using the data. And it's when I work with people who are you know, making those course changes, you know, again, we're not talking whole course redesigns because, you know, those can take a lot, whoops, a lot of time, but just looking at making improvements step-by-step -step strategically, choosing one of two areas, either one that was a success, that's an area of comfort in that, you know, back and forth, you know, that content, you know, you can anticipate the questions the students are going to ask, but you really need to transition that better to a more interactive assignment for the fully online or the you know high flex whatever variation you're teaching it so either starting with an area of that's comfort content wise for you so that when you're learning the new tools and applying the new strategies you're not learning as much at the same time or looking for those things that are as kelly 
showed in the data, troublesome for your students. Because again, if you're putting time and energy into making a change and doing things differently, you want the most bang for your buck. So you want to really just hone in. What's that one critical concept that you need students to understand better? And that's where you want to, you know, again, make a choice from those. I also put a link in the presentation to one that we did earlier on student management, you know, different ways to set up groups, because some of that also helps you focus your energy on the content, not the logistics. So again, we'll share this presentation and you'll be able to look at that one later. A second thing to do is that quality over quantity. So, you know, again, Kelly looked at and shared some of the different ways. I like to go when I'm in Canvas, you know, at the top of the screen where there's that collapse all. If you collapse your module, so you're just seeing the title of the module or even just look at the paper copy of your course schedule. You know, bring out the post-its, use the post-its and then rank those modules or rank your, the concepts that you need the students to, to know and rank them in the order from most important to least important. Sometimes there are things that we prefer to do in our course, but we know they might be easier than others for students to learn later because maybe there are more resources out in the public web, but there are certain aspects that only you personally know from your professional background. So prioritizing them, you know, quality over quantity. That way, if something does happen to, you know, need to be changed, we make another shift, something weird happens, we lose a two, you know, couple weeks of education we didn't plan on. If you've prioritized it, then you have already planned in which things you might let go of. I put combine assignments. That is something that is really helpful to do to help students make those connections and to increase that quantity, uh, the quality level without adding quantity, but instead thinking of, say, a research paper. I'm using that as an example just because most people are familiar with the steps. You know, in face-to-face, -face, it was a lot easier for people to just hand out the assignment directions. You know, so you gave out the assignment directions, you checked on it face-to-face, -face, maybe once or twice, maybe they handed in a draft, and then they handed in the final paper. If you, for online, don't add more assignments, but break it down into smaller chunks, that helps the students, you know, go through it, but it also, you know, helps them kind of keep their thinking consistently, because whether it's, you know, a result of COVID or if it's a result of something else going on in their lives, you know, because of all the different changes, the more you can help them make those connections between assignments through your class, kind of creating those through paths. That's another way that you can, again, just take one assignment, but adapt it so that it is easier for the students to manage. And then this one is really the biggie, you know, altering those assignments to increase engagement because that, you know, engagement, not just into the content, but with their peers, with other people. And even if it's virtual, making sure that they've got those connections. If you can take one of your bigger assignments or more troublesome assignments and use that as a way to increase engagement, it's kind of like the difference between, you know, you tossing the rope to your students if they're drowning one time because you're one person, one instructor, and so you have one rope to toss versus when you increase that engagement, then all of a sudden it's like, just think they're in the water, but there's tons of people tossing them ropes. The reason I chose this picture, it's just a picture of a Facebook group because one of the benefits to online, if we embrace being fully online, there are so many resources out there where we can help our students do two things. We can help them use that social media as a learning platform in terms of finding resources, you know, connecting with other people with similar interests because they might feel relatively isolated. A lot of faculty feel isolated too because they're not getting to talk to each other. And so using, you know, creating the assignments where perhaps they have to find two research articles as well as to public on the web resources. You know, you can adapt them that way. But another related piece to that that really builds that engagement with students and helps them make connections is having them share their work and their examples out in the public forum. Because 
we're all looking for the answers to the questions, but it gives it more authenticity and allows them, again, to get peer feedback, to find others with similar interest, and it kind of you know, ups the rationale. It's a lot more motivating if you're creating something that other people are going to see versus creating something, yet one more assignment that you submit on Blackboard and, or not, sorry, not Blackboard, but Canvas, and then you know, people are just only your instructors looking at or maybe the one person who peer reviewed. And you can also, one of the things that we do a lot, Kelly and I, when we work with faculty, a lot of times if you put in, take one of your assignments that perhaps used to be just an assignment and you're using the assignment function, the people that see it would be the student and yourself and perhaps if you're using the peer review. However, you can combine many of those or shift them over to a discussion forum because you can still give your graded feedback separately but if you're having them create pieces that are you know, more visual or more appropriate to share with other audiences, having that in the discussion forum where they can see each other's work and give feedback, it builds for more you know, exciting discussions. Even things like challenging them to go find, you know, what is the best video out there that you have seen that shows us how to properly wash our hands for COVID? There are all kinds of things that you can connect right back to your curriculum and then all of a sudden they're populating the discussion with these really interesting resources. But you haven't necessarily, if you had to teach, you know, how to create a video for washing hands as a part of your curriculum, you haven't added, you know, you're not adding more content, you're not adding more stress, but you're leveraging what technology can bring you. And this one is a biggie. In a recent conference I was at, the ACT conference, there was a lot of talk about the fact that we are all in the same storm but we are not all in the same boat. And this is huge because with these COVID effects, what's happening across the board and not just you know, at fairs, but worldwide, is when something happens in someone's life because of COVID, it's not necessarily the same time as when it happens to someone else. So if you look at the number of students you've got, whether you've got you know, 100 students, 150, I know pharmacy, some of the, the classes are incredibly large and then you've got to share out smaller groups of students, you know, the number of factors of when one of your students is handling something versus when you are having to handle something versus when the university changes something. So we can make, we can build in our flexibility, you know, right into our course. So knowing, you know, kind of planning ahead of time so that we're not blindsided by this. So some examples are, you know, flexible deadlines. When I was teaching students in actually at GVSU, same as Kelly, um, one of the graduate classes that I was teaching, we built in a two week window for all the assignments. So they could either turn it in on week one for the people who wanted to get started, and then they still would have time to get feedback on it, or they could hand it in on the second week, knowing that they might not get that rough draft, but they had two different windows. It was left open for an additional week rather than having it one week only. And I would say about half the class each semester I taught it took advantage of that. Um, you know, those wider submission windows. It used to be, you know, in the pre-pandemic days, it was very common for faculty to say all of your assignments would open on, you know, Monday and they would close Sunday night thinking that the students have a work week and a weekend. A very simple change that you can help your students be more successful is just widening that submission and maybe even just overlapping the weekend so they've got two weekends. So maybe it's opening your new unit on Friday night for your submissions and keeping it open, you know, almost 10 days through Monday morning. So they've got, you know, again, a little bit more playtime in case something happens or because, you know, healthcare is one of the fields greatly impacted where people are either not working and they have extra time or they are overworking and they are working incredible hours and getting called in so that building in an extra weekend, allowing people to adjust. All the parents who have kids at home who have to figure out how to homeschool and then do their own schooling. And then another piece is that, you know, options for assessment. You can ask the same question, you know, like for example, you know, maybe your question is, you know, how would you evaluate a web resource for appropriate use with a K-12 class? 
but you can change the way, instead of having them write up that criteria, you know, perhaps they can share that information in a way that suits them, giving them more options on how to meet that criteria. Because that, again, just changing that for your students can help them work out of their strength instead of always, you know, working out of what you're identifying as a strength, just giving them those options. Another piece that that does is it just gives them a little bit more control because through this whole process, those behind the scenes factors, what the research on the trauma informed education has been showing consistently is people don't feel like they have control over areas of their life. So if you can give that, you know, build in that flexibility so they can make a choice, it's helping them, you know, do a better job at that self-regulated learning, you know, taking control of their own resources. And again, embrace those online benefits. When we made that shift to emergency remote teaching, a lot of people just transition, you know, almost identically class time to class time, face to face to a Zoom synchronous Zoom session. But Laura and other people who have taught fully online can tell you that when you actually look at, okay, I'm teaching fully online, which means now all of a sudden I've got this freedom. I've got freedom of time, but I've also got freedom to connect my students to anywhere in the world that they can get internet. I don't have to simply stay, you know, kind of like within the campus. I can start connecting them to, you know, maybe it's different hospitals, different technology departments, different um, professional organizations. So you can connect them all of a sudden anywhere. It's not, you know, it's no longer limited by the amount of time or by that place. If we really embrace it and think, okay, how can we do it differently? Maybe I still have them work in the small groups, just like I did in the face-to-face -face environment, but maybe I give them control, identify the small groups and let them pick however they want to, you know, converse with each other. Some people like Teams, some people like Zoom. Some people like, I mean, there's a whole bunch that have come out recently, you know, obviously because we're all dealing with this and just letting them choose how they get together. Those are some, again, just some simple ways you can just take one assignment and just apply any of those strategies to help them master it. One of the assignments that Kelly's familiar with as well when we were at GDSU at the time, the common assignment for pre-service teachers is they create what's called a technology integrated lesson plan. And in that technology integrated lesson plan, it's the semester before their student teaching. So they're not actually teaching at that time. They are, you know, a student and they're doing their observation. But having them think through, we would see all the time the students would write these lesson plans where it was for this dream perfect class and this dream perfect world. And we would read these lesson plans. And we're like, yeah, right, good luck with that in the back of our head, because you know, as someone who's already taught, you know certain things are doomed for failure quickly. And to get a way for them to be able to see that perspective, I redesigned that activity. So it was a simulation activity where they created a digital story. You know, again, they could film themselves, however, and this was before the pandemic, but they had to role play as if they were the student telling their parent or their family member what they did in school that day. And so they had to walk through their own lesson plan and think about, well, what would the student say about this? What would be interesting to the student? What would the student share, you know, want to share with somebody else? And through that, it gave them not only practice with the technologies that we wanted them to learn, but it really helped them emphasize or empathize with the student experience. So those are, you know, again, just taking advantage of the fact that cell phones can make recordings, students can be creative, TikTok has taken over. I mean, the TikToks, there's so many modeled things out there of using technology for entertainment, but we can take that and twist it to use it for you know, our content. And it just really, again, helps students build those connections. Great, that was a great, a great suggestion, if I could pipe in there. Yeah. you. Um, talked about that's empathizing. When you're looking at the student experience, putting on that hat, <clears throat> that is actually part of that design process. That's the first one, empathizing. It's thinking through what, what is what does it look like in your course if you're the student? And working through one of your modules, how long does it take? Well, what does that feel like? Can I find everything? Is Are the directions there? Are the instructions clear? Um, those kinds of things are very, it's just eye-opening <clears throat> when you literally go through your own course as a student, like Tracy was saying, 
it's, it's like, oh, okay, I guess I should put that in there. I didn't tell them this. Um, and that is the empathize uh, part of the, the whole evaluation process. And um, with discussions, like Tracy was saying, it's, it even makes it more engaging when they do their discussion board responses in a video. Just ask them to explain these three questions or you know these three content items in uh, two minutes or three minutes uh, in a video response instead of typing it out. <clears throat> that also lets you know all the students see each other um, and talk to each other, and it's built right in the Canvas reply box, or they could even do it on their phone or whatever. They they know how to video and get it there, um, <clears throat> but it is also offered right in your course. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on what Tracy was saying. Go ahead, Tracy. Anything else? Heather, it looks like you had a question or maybe an idea to share. Okay, you said that thoughtful look. Yeah, as Kelly was saying, one of the easy ways, even in your existing discussion boards, um, because a lot of people have things like, you know, explain three reasons, explain whatever. If you simply add, explain to and add an audience and add a variety of audiences, into that criteria, it really changes the game for the students. And then it kind of, again, connects it to the real world. Cause like, for example, when I taught fourth grade, I would break the directions down one way. When I taught fifth grade, it was different. When I did professional development for a middle school, high school, college, you're talking to different audiences. And in many careers, it's the same thing. You're not always interacting with somebody who's just like you. Very often you're interacting with other, other audiences. So looking through your discussion boards and just seeing which ones might be ones where you say, you know, explain this concept as if you were presenting it to the policy board, you know, or the ethics board, or to your aging grandmother. Steve Carnes is a, teaches in the, I don't know, it's the health, HCSA, but he teaches it, one of the classes is the nursing home management. And one of his assignments is awesome. I think Kelly might've worked with him on this earlier was he has the students research and then they have to write a letter to one of their own aging relatives or, or friends explaining how to select a different nursing home, what they would want to look for in a nursing home. And so it's a real letter and then they can share the letters. So again, just adding that, it's a lot more fun to think, okay, if I'm explaining nursing home criteria for my peers or for my faculty or for my professor because they told me to do it versus oh gosh, I have to explain this to grandma. Huge difference in how we go about doing it. So again, sit, you know, just tweaking that assignment through that design thinking process, just what's, you know, small changes that you can just build in. And the relevancy, like you were saying, it makes it relevant because it's like, it's not just a paper to turn into a professor. All of a sudden you're rethinking, you know, if it is a <clears throat> policy board and a you know, future job, what does that look like? If you're an art critic, if you're, you know, writing the paper instead of to your professor, to your grandma that you can use or to the school board or whatever the case may be, it just puts a different relevance on it. And it is a role playing and it's scenario using, but it's really just making it real world relevant for them. And probably more fun for you to grade. <laughs> So we have a good chunk of time remaining. Do we want, we have some different options. We can have, you know, if you have specific questions or if anyone has even maybe one of those assignments that you would like to have kind of the group brainstorm on. Because what I find working with faculty is whenever you put a group of faculty together and you throw out a teaching challenge or something you've encountered, if you put the group together and just let everybody share their own experiences, Pretty much they can solve any kind of teaching challenge. So I don't know if someone has something that they've encountered or that they would like to do for spring and wants to just kind of share. I just kind of have a general question and it's, you know, moving obviously this semester, I kind of, my design is completely different because I had, you know, everything organized differently. I moved from like PowerPoint and that's where I used to have all my presentations online if they wanted to see them. And I moved to like weekly, like week one, week two, because then I, you know, put all the assignments and all the power, like, and so I guess, and I'm going to ask my students next week is, what have you found that, I mean, is that a good way to do it? Is there a better way to do it? Like for ease of navigation, I guess is what I'm asking. That's a great way to ask your students and get their feedback because even within disciplines, you would get a different answer. Certain disciplines, like for example, um, 
in a lot of the criminal justice courses, I mean, they have, it's very procedural, it's very lockstep, they like it a certain way. You know, when you get the language arts, you know, you just get differences in the way some people tend to think about it. Well, so I guess since it. I can't talk to all these different faculty, my thought was to ask the students what things they've liked and haven't liked. And then, you know, I feel like I can kind of pick their brains because I'm only seeing what I'm doing. I'm not seeing what other, I mean, I have actually, I've been added to two other colleagues courses so I can kind of see how they're doing things and teaching FSUS is interesting to see how they've done it. But um, I guess I just wanted to ask you, are there general formatting like is the weekly modules better than then just having it blocked or I, I think from what we have found working with faculty um and for and from the student side as well that they appreciate the weekly course schedule what are the expectations because as tracy was mentioning there are other disciplines that have it takes weeks to do their unit, weeks to do a project, <clears throat> but the students really appreciate a weekly kind of guiding. You know, at this, it's kind of like a, at this point this week, you should have read these chapters if you're gonna have the, an end, you know, research paper or something on a whole book, what, what is the guidance to keep you on track? Because if you think they've got, a lot of them have four or five classes, some have labs with it. So it helps them just time management wise to stay organized. Now, if it's a three week project, we know not every student's gonna do, some are gonna wait to the three days for it's due. I mean, there's nothing we can do about that, but from a, a planning um, organizational standpoint, it helps the students if they kind of know each week, what, what do I need to do to stay on track? And even if they don't necessarily do that all that at the same time. And do you think it's best? So like, I, I do have a couple big projects in my classes. And so my question is, do I put the grading rubric and all that stuff at the start when it's being assigned and then have it actually on the end of when it's due so they can find it in both places? That is one of the great features about Canvas. If you use that automatic linking tool, you know, when you add the link, if you've created that rubric and, and put it there, as long as you, you can include that link in multiple areas, in multiple places, okay. right? So you don't have to worry about, you know, connecting them to one thing and then maybe you adapt it or make a change and then they might get confused because it'll always make sure that they're connected to exactly the same place. Okay. Did anyone else have any? Um, so I, um, I actually kind of in, what, what Catherine just was asking, I actually created an online teaching survey that I sent all of my students like on week two or week three, where I asked them, you know, is the CAMEX course working for you? Is it easy to navigate? Do you need anything else? Um, it had a series of questions um, and I did it through Microsoft Forms. <clears throat> and so I just put the link in there and then I could download the whole thing as an Excel file and take a look at that. So I got really great feedback from them right away. Um, and I do weekly sort of chunked units with all of my classes. But um, I guess my question was in your discussions about being flexible for students and allowing these flexible deadlines, have you ever run where, I mean, I ran into that with students this semester that they wanted structure they wanted just the opposite of flexibility. They wanted to know when is it gonna open? When is it gonna close? I need a very tight, concise sort of structure so that I can plan the rest of my life. And when I did these more open-ended kind of giving them a little more space, they floundered. They needed very clear, concise. I could, couldn't say, you could do a video, you can do a this, you can do a that. Nope, they wanted me to just to say, this is what I want from you. This is how I'm going to grade it. So how do you then balance those two things? Or do you just, again, survey the students and kind of get a feel for what they want in the beginning? That's a really great question because it hits on a couple of different areas. Um, so for example, when we're talking UDL, when I was giving that example of having them have different ways that they're able to show their understanding. I, put, I don't give them like the blank page, like write about any topic that you want because that hits into exactly what you're saying, Anne, where they, they floundered. No, but some people may like getting that, but the majority of people don't like such wide open because the people who are going to underachieve are like, oh, I'll write a paragraph. And the people who really want to do it right, they're like, oh my gosh, does she want a 10 page academic research paper book? I, and I can't, and then, you know, they're just all bills. But if you give them say two or three choices, you know, and give them a sample so that they know, 
approximately what you're looking at. So it's a choice, but it's not so wide. It's kind of like the difference between going into, um, like for example, when you used to go to McDonald's and you asked for a coffee, it was small, medium, or large with cream, with sugar, with both. That was it. That's manageable. You go to a Starbucks and you've got a million different choices. And again, there are times we all love having a million choices, but during this pandemic is not necessarily one of them, but having some is good. And then that structure, um, when Kelly and I work with faculty, where we have them plan out, you know, their week by week, if you look at your course schedule, that's the best way to see. And that's where I build in that consistency. So it's not having kind of like wide open deadlines all the time. It is, like I said, either maybe expanding it so all units open on Friday and go through the following Monday. So there's an overlap of the deadline, but it's still every week there's a new you know, content. And then I use those other, those interactive pieces to help them build that structure because I don't want them to get so far behind where it's high stakes. So it might be that, you know, you have a discussion board that is always due by Wednesday. So you know they've at least gotten started by Wednesday. And then you have, you know, a paper draft due, you know, on Monday morning or something. But so if your class met face to face prior, if it was normal for that class to meet three times because that was the best way for them to learn the content, then consider your online time. You don't necessarily need them to be synchronous three times a week but you want to have three check-ins because if cognitively it worked best that way for them before, cognitively, it's still probably going to work best. So in that case, maybe it's, you know, you have a mini quiz on the readings on, by Tuesday that you have to get done. That way, you know, they've read the chapters and maybe it's only a five question quiz or a two, you know, just simple, low stakes, the equivalent of a participation grade. And then maybe then it's Wednesday or Thursday where they have to make some type of discussion response about, finding a video that showed a concept from the reading chapter or something. And then a third check-in with a, you know, a different assignment. So three times, you know, kind of matching that cognitive breakup, however you broke it up before based on the way you know students need to learn it, kind of use those check-ins so that they're still pacing themselves. And absolutely, if you make your discussion, Kelly and I have times, and again, you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. But making sure that when um, we'll look across their discussion board due dates or something or the assignment due dates, and one week it's Monday, and one week it's Thursday, and one week it's Friday, and it's like, whoa, be, con you know, be consistent. And maybe, you know, parenting is another good example. They tell you most parenting <laughs> styles people can adjust to as long as it's consistent. Yeah. So I agree with Tracy on that structure, but still the choice. So some ideas of that <clears throat> might be something like um, the flexibility piece. You might say, what, you know, if you got 14 discussion boards, 14 weeks or 12 in 14 weeks, <clears throat> you might say, you know what, you get a buy. So if you miss one, it doesn't hurt your score. Like life happens. And that way they're still, they can still get an A and miss one. So that's a flexibility piece. Um, you can also build in, Variety is the big piece. So st statistically, this, the DFW rates increase significantly on a course that is like, read the chapter, take the test, read the chapter, take the test, answer the chapter questions on the discussion board. It's not an engaging course. So like you're saying, Anne, like, okay, need, need variety. How do you do that structurally? So in my courses, I'll say, here's your discussion board. Ref reflect on something you did quite often. What did you learn at that reflective piece and learning? Um, and then maybe I'll ask another content question to make sure they got it. Um, so it's more, it's not like a chapter, you know, and a chapter kind of, um, question, but it's more of how are they processing that, helping them processing it in scaffold. But the other piece, then I will have a discussion board one week and the next week it's a video response. You know, it's just, it's, it's a different, instead of saying each week you can either do this or this or this. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what do I need to do? I just vary it each time is different. So it keeps them engaged, but they don't necessarily always have to choose. Now, at any point, I would not mind if they ever did a video response instead of typing it. It doesn't bother me. But 
um, in most professions in the world we live in right now, they need to be comfortable with a video, whether it's on Zoom or a presentation for work and they're stuck at home or they're in education and they're teaching. Pretty much most people need to be able to give information in a video format, even if it's a three minute or five minute or less, because um, you don't want to sit and watch 20 minutes for each student of whatever, like it's concise. You want it to be maybe three minutes because you know if you say three, it's going to be five or six. But anyway, so just varying it um, for engagement purposes and um, but still that structure piece like Tracy was talking through so that like you say, they can plan because especially in this world, it seems like it feels more out of control for everybody and they appreciate that structure piece, but also the variety. Good question. Yeah, I mean, consider like the structure, a lot of it, think of it as, you know, your, your course, when you're teaching face-to-face, -face, a lot of the structure is the students know they go to a building, they walk upstairs, you know what doors look like, you know what exit signs look like, you know how to look for libraries, like those things are pretty common. You can go to any college campus and you can figure out, okay, if I'm on a college campus, there's gotta be signs telling me where to look. And if I need help, they may call their library something, but I know there's probably the library is a good place to start. So there are these structures that are common. And so when we're doing the online version, you know, that's where making sure that that, you know, that navigation, like Catherine brought up the, you know, do you go weekly? And I love that Anne used, you know, surveyed her students on some of those things. Keeping the structure in the, the format and the design so they know where to look. And then that variety goes in the thinking and the questions, you know, some of that so that, you know, like Kelly said, they're not doing the same thing conceptually for 14 weeks straight because that's not very realistic in many of our careers that we go to college for. We don't think about the same thing all the time. We do a variety of tasks. And truth be told, how many of us would want to do that for 14 weeks either <laughs> in a course? It's, it's hard. And I would love to know if, if you had any aha moments or what type of feedback did you get from your students, if you remember any of it. I got, I mean, I still have the, the results. I got really great feedback because my courses um, are like uber, uber organized. I can share my screen really quick if you want me to. Oh, sure. Um, uh, my, my courses are like really sort of um, like, so this is my graphic history of graphic design course. So this is the, the landing page and I highlight in green the modules that we've already gone through so that they have this visual reference immediately. So as we go through, so you can see um, this is where we're at. So they can immediately see where they, what, where they should, what they should be done. But for each of these, if they clicked on it, it would take them to, can you still, yeah, you can still mm -hmm. see it. It yeah. takes them then to the page they have a page and a quiz, so it takes them to the page. The page gives them their reading links and videos. Um, they have to mark it as done, then they take their quiz. So I can't get this to go all the way down, but um, I mean, there's no book for the class. So I've sort of taken a lot of the information, <laughs> put it in here. Um, and, so, and so then like all of that's here, like what is the week's, what do they have to do? And then they have to do assignments. So visual analysis assignments, so those are in a separate column so that they can, they don't have to wait for the module because the modules are locked till a certain point, mm -hmm. um, but they could jump ahead and look at assignments. So the assignments are not in modules. They're separated out as links as, as our sort of discussion posts and stuff. So, um, I mean, all my classes are set up like, like that, but I mean, one, I guess the one thing I learned um, is to take care of myself because I have 103 students. So I, I myself cannot be super uber flexible or I'm working 24 seven all week long. And I have found teaching online to be so much more exhausting than teaching in the classroom. And, you know, like doing 103 independent studies and just, you know, walking students through. So in the spring, I'm going to, you know, set my calendar out and plan like what I'm going to be doing in each class so that I'm not bombarded with grading 103 assignments every single weekend and I have no time for my family or anything else. So I, I have to find an even balance between making sure the course is rigorous and I'm getting what I want from them and 
making time for my life because I find online teaching really exhausting. I'm glad you said that about caring for yourself. That's where I would suggest the things that Tracy talked through, combining some of your assignments um, and peer reviews, having them do some of the correcting so that it's not all you doing every week and then there, you shouldn't have to do that every week. I did do peer reviews. Um, and I didn't get good feedback at all, even though I gave them a very specific rubric to mm -hmm. use to review. Most of them said they felt very uncomfortable commenting on other students' papers. Um, and did so, it, I, can I ask you, did you do that on like, is it in a breakout room or how are you no, managing no, no. it? They submitted a draft of their paper and then Canvas will automatically, if you set it up, you can either do it automatically or manually, but Canvas um, automatically sort of then dispersed them to peer review. So they reviewed the paper and they had a very specific rubric of things they were looking for, but they were super hesitant to really engage with the paper. And then when after I, after the assignment, I sort of, we had a discussion and they said they didn't feel um, comfortable commenting uh, and on other people's papers. So I, I know, was I actually, I was surprised at my, I taught FSUS this semester and they actually liked the group work in the breakout and they said it was, and so I'm wondering if you set it up that way in breakout rooms and then you jump between the rooms to kind of help facilitate. I don't know. I, cause that was one of the questions. Cause I started doing breakout rooms a lot at the beginning of the semester. And that was one of the things on my, um, my, my question poll, question poll that I gave them. And I would say 90%, it came back that they hated breakout rooms. Really? But once they got to the breakout rooms, they, you know, they, you know, some people who would turn their cameras off, some people weren't participating, they just, yeah. they would leave, they, they just didn't like it. So, hmm. you know, as big as my classes were, I just tried to facilitate, facilitate it as a group discussion, but I actually, I have to go, I have class in five minutes. Um, so, but thank you very much. Joining us. Thank you. I got to go on. Ron, bye. Bye. I, yeah, to the peer review uh, part that Anne was referring to, one of the things that works really well for peer review is making sure that what the students are um, giving feedback on to the other student isn't something that's brand new to them and isn't like the grading. So kind of separating out the types of things that they do feel comfortable. Like, for example, a really great thing to have them peer edit for in a formal paper is they can edit for APA for, or give feedback on APA formatting, those types of things. It, you know, it gives them a specific criteria that's set in stone. It's not new. It's kind of cut and dried. It's not making a personal judgment, especially if they're, you know, 100 and 200 level students where they might not mm -hmm. feel very comfortable about. I, I actually did this. And I think I brought this up at one of your other training sessions because I had them and it's a 200 level class, but it was, I made a, um, a survey monkey mm -hmm. instead of having it go through Canvas. And it was like, did they cover these topics? And so it was easier to be like, you know, did they talk about the, the history of the company, whatever, whatever. And I think they, you know, they didn't really have a problem giving it because it was really like yes or no, or they mm -hmm. covered it. Like, you know, it was either yes, well, well done or not fully or whatever, whatever. And so it really wasn't, like personal, I guess. And so I love that idea, like to do that, um, not as clear, because really the peer review is, I feel like the biggest benefit of that is, is the clarity. It's so hard to clearly define papers for students or anyone to clearly communicate what it is they're trying to say. And I feel like that clarity, like you, you had that survey monkey is great because you're saying, you know, is it clear? Yes, not quite. You know. <laughs> But I think I mentioned this before is uh, a lot of the same people take my classes and they were com they were completing it and giving them all the credit before they were, were done with the survey it was coming to my email. I was getting these like survey completed. I'm like, what is going on? And so, yeah, that was funny. That was like, you know, one of the things of teaching online, I had everyone get on, turn their cameras on. Mm -hmm. They like, listen, the idea behind this is the giving them positive or negative feedback. It's not to just give them all the points. Yeah. yeah. Young, young or Laura, I don't know. We only have, um, I think, three minutes left. Nope, two minutes left. So I didn't know if you had any either ideas or feedback or questions that did not already get addressed or suggestions that you'd like to just throw out. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just want to make sure you've got a chance to, to share. This has been uh, terribly reinforcing. 
because I do this uh, survey, I do a survey, an orientation survey, and then at midterm, I do a survey that sounded a lot like, was it Ann, whoever just left, um, as a survey to find out what's going well, what's not going so well, and any other feedback. And I find that uh, terribly enlightening. Um, one thing about flexibility that I do when I do my um, calendar for the term is, you know, of course I have the due dates for items. And then I look from that personal care standpoint where I might have some flexibility and when I see them, the students are maybe perhaps kind of struggling at a certain point, I'll do the, uh, oh, um, it's due on Friday, but I'm going to give you a, um, you know, 48 hours grace period where you don't even, you know, even have to contact me. Uh, there's, there'll be no penalties, you, you know, and, and they feel like they've been, they've received a gift. Uh -huh. um, yeah, or if it comes out in the survey um, that they feel a little crunched for, for particular types of assignment, then I can maybe extend time. So, and they feel like they're empowered with that. So I kind of look ahead and try to anticipate where they might have some challenges and then allow them extra time. Um, I do have one short question. Um, I do the uh, uh, posting of certain assignments in the discussion so that the whole class can value from the content that the students have shared. And for those, I don't necessarily uh, grade the student responses. It, you know, the person that's getting graded is the person who posted. But what I find out is that when uh, students um, aren't receiving a grade, I'll say to reply that I, I get very few um, replies from the other students. And if this one, if there's any ideas on how you can make sure that the students are reading the other students posting. Yeah, I think that- I'll give it a grade. Yeah, that goes into in my experience that kind of overwhelms sometimes that students feel like when you look at all 20. And so a lot of times I recommend having kind of what I call base camp groups. So they might be a smaller group that goes throughout. And so when you're having them post to that discussion, I have them post to, you know, the different threads. I just, I have, so I have it, let me back up a second. I have one discussion forum so they could see all, you know, say 25 people if they wanted to. But I have them, I start with, you know, four or five threads. So it's groups of, you know, four to six students, depending on how many are in that section. And they only post in that one. So that kind of builds that small group feel, just like if they were in a face-to-face -face classroom, more like they're sitting at the table. So now it's more personal because if it's uh, us five and I post mine and none of you give feedback, it's like, wait a minute, you know, I gave feedback on yours, don't you like me? And the students really do talk about that type of reaction. And but, then they can't post the second post if no one commented on their first post, they can't respond, you know. <laughs> but they feel more comfortable even reaching out and saying, you know, Laura, I know that you said something about experiencing this in the past. Did I do it right? Or, you know, they, they reach across in the smaller group in a way that they wouldn't in the large group. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Young, we have, I, actually, I think we are, yeah, we are two minutes over. I don't know if you had any questions or feedback or otherwise I think we're going to go ahead and end the recording and then we'll share this out. We have a playlist that we are collecting all the different of these PD sessions on there that's you know in the same e-learning YouTube account but you know separate so you can just kind of bookmark it. And are they on your web that because I was going to go to the one this afternoon but I can't this afternoon and so are they just on the website easy to find like by date or time or when they were offered or topic? Dan put them all out in the YouTube or in, in the UWN. I think he put out all the different ones for November and December. And then we have a YouTube, our YouTube channel is on the, if you go to the ferris.edu, the e-learning training page. Got it. That okay. That's our, you know, the links to all the different ones. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Catherine. Thanks for coming, guys. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, Laura. you. Goodbye. Yeah, bye, bye bye. And thanks, Young. I'm going to end the meeting.